Hello everyone, my name is Drew Brotherston, and welcome to this talk entitled Aliasing in the Outflow Tract, and a special thanks to Dr. Robert Arntfield for his guidance in developing this screencast. But before I launch into things, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever seen this? This is pulse wave Doppler signal obtained from the left ventricular outflow tract, and it shows aliasing, or flow velocity beyond the limit that can be measured by pulse wave, where it wraps around from the negative back to the positive baseline. If you've seen this when measuring LVOT VTI and you weren't sure how to proceed, or if you've heard of outflow obstruction or SAM but you aren't sure if you've encountered it before, or if you're aspiring to become an advanced critical care echocardiographer or write the NBE exam, then you've come to the right place. Which brings us to the main topic of this screencast, which is how to evaluate left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Our objectives are going to be fourfold. We're going to launch right into things with how to identify left ventricular outflow tract obstruction using POCUS, and we're going to center it around a clinical case. Our next objective is going to be to discuss the actual mechanism by which LVOTO occurs, followed by a little bit of a review on the management. And finally, we'll discuss some of the pitfalls in our assessment, in particular the spectral Doppler aspects of using POCUS. But now on to our first objective. You're looking after a 67-year-old female who's been admitted to the ICU with severe COVID ARDS and is being mechanically ventilated. She's around post-admit day 8 and has become significantly volume positive, and as a consequence is undergoing aggressive diuresis. She suddenly develops hypotension and tachycardia and is started on norepinephrine. Her pressure requirements rapidly escalate, however, and she is now requiring 45 micrograms per minute of norepinephrine and vasopressin has been added as well. Naturally, you proceed with a focused bedside echocardiogram to evaluate for potential etiologies of shock. The first thing that you notice is that the images are rather technically limited, but you're rapidly able to determine that there is no underlying cardiogenic shock, certainly no RV failure, and no pericardial tamponade due to the absence of an effusion, and there's no catastrophic valvulopathy. The other thing that you notice, in addition to the fact that the heart is quite hyperdynamic and the ejection fraction is almost 100%, is that the septum is quite thickened, and there is a prominent septal knuckle, which is partially obstructing the LVOT. You proceed onwards with an assessment of the LVOT VTI and notice significant aliasing. Now, this combination of factors should lead you to consider left ventricular outflow obstruction. And though I'll get into this a little bit more detail later, this should be raised in your mind the moment that you see a significantly hyperdynamic or underfilled heart, and if there's any underlying altered LVOT geometry. Given that our patient has already satisfied these two criteria, we're going to proceed on with a focused assessment for left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The least sophisticated way and sometimes the most effective method for evaluation is just to look for if there's actual visible evidence of obstruction in 2D. This is somewhat difficult in the case of our patient owing to the technical limitations of this study, but if you pay very close attention, you can see that during end systole that the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is coming in rather close contact with the septum, whereas ordinarily it should be displaced by the forward blood flow through the LVOT. If you find yourself in doubt, you can freeze the image and cycle back through the clips individually looking for the period of systole and looking for this close contact between the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the septum. I've tried to mimic this a little bit by enlarging and slowing down the clip, and I do think that this does better demonstrate the fact that during systole, the mitral valve is coming quite close to the septum and in fact is being pulled slightly away from the posterior valve, leading to a loss of coaptation indicative of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, or SAM, which is the dynamic aspect of LVOT obstruction. To provide a clearer example of this, let's look at this transesophageal ultrasound. Now, for those who may be less familiar with transesophageal ultrasound, this is a midesophageal long-axis view, with the LA seen in the near field, the left ventricle, which is hyperdynamic and completely collapsing, a fairly thick-looking septum, and here is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the LVOT. And we can very clearly see that during systole, it's being pulled towards the septum, causing significant obstruction. Once again, just to really drive this home, I've decreased the depth and slowed down the clip. And here we can very clearly see the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve being pulled into the LVOT during systole, causing significant narrowing and obstruction. Following 2D assessment, the next step is to use spectral Doppler to both localize and grade the degree of obstruction.
And if there are no adequate 2D images to actually see the LVOT obstruction, then this may be the only way for us to actually detect it. The process is referred to as walking the pulse gate. To do this, we begin in the apical 5 chamber view, which I've zoomed in here to hone in on the LV cavity, the LVOT, and the aortic valve. We start by placing the pulse wave gate in the mid cavity. This is what a normal waveform in the mid cavity looks like low amplitude and parabolic in shape. We then move down to the LVOT, which under normal circumstances should have a triangular shaped waveform that's a bit higher amplitude, typically less than 1.7 meters per second. And if we're in appropriate position, we should see the closing snap of the aortic valve. The final position is to move down to the level of the aortic valve itself, which will also have a triangular shaped waveform, and you should see both an opening and closing snap of the aortic valve. This is in order to screen for underlying aortic stenosis, which we'll talk about the significance of later. Now we'll demonstrate the process with our patient in real time. Now it's not ideal, but owing to the lack of endocardial resolution, I've actually placed a color box over the LV cavity, the LVOT, and the aortic valve, just to give us a better sense of the blood flow. Once again, we start by placing the pulse wave gate in the mid cavity, and you'll notice off the bat that it's quite a bit different than the normal version that we saw before, with the peak velocity being quite a bit higher and having this dagger-shaped appearance of slower initial velocity and then a sharp increased and a sudden drop-off. This is actually consistent with an obstructive waveform and hints that our patient probably has some degree of mid-cavity obstruction, though it's probably not as significant. Next we move down to the LVOT and we see that there is significant aliasing and no sign of that characteristic triangular waveform that we're used to seeing at this level. Last, we move to the aortic valve. Now in our example, there is a fair amount of noise coming from the valve itself, and we aren't seeing a very clear waveform through here. However, if there was significant aortic stenosis, supra or subvalvular, we would expect it to have significant aliasing somewhat similar to the LVOT. So even though the waveform is not great, we can tell that it's probably not playing a significant part in this picture. Now that we've identified that the LVOT is the source of the most significant flow acceleration, we're going to switch over to the continuous wave Doppler to better characterize both the morphology of the waveform and its maximum velocity. And we get something that looks like this. These waveforms show a characteristic pattern of LVOT obstruction, where during early systole, there's a more gradual rise However, as the obstruction develops, there's a sudden acceleration with an abrupt drop-off with the cessation of flow. This is what is known as a dagger-shaped waveform. Now, the severity of LVOT obstruction is measured using the peak gradient, which is four times the peak velocity squared. A gradient of less than 30 millimeters of mercury is unlikely to be hemodynamically significant, and in the assessment of a patient in shock, other etiologies should be considered to avoid over-attribution of shock to obstruction. With a peak gradient of greater than 50 millimeters of mercury, however, there's a high probability of hemodynamic significance, and the patient is at risk for worsening obstructive shock, especially with escalating ionotropy, tachycardia, or loss of preload. And in the case of our patient, the peak systolic velocity was 3.83 meters per second, translating to a peak gradient of 58.7 millimeters of mercury, which was most certainly severe. Now that we've gone through how to approach the evaluation of LVOT obstruction using POCUS, I do want to take a bit of a step back and look at the underlying mechanism of LVOT obstruction. And for everyone who is here just for the assessment portion, thanks for stopping by. And for all you physiology nerds, let's prepare for a little bit more of a deep dive. Which brings us to our second objective, which is what is the mechanism of dynamic LVOT obstruction? Now, as we mentioned already, there's really two things that you need for dynamic obstruction to occur. And it's the combination of a hyperdynamic or underfilled state plus an altered LVOT. In terms of conditions leading to altered LVOT geometry, there are really two groups. The first is where you have a global reduction in end diastolic dimension, which comes from either hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, LVH from chronically elevated afterload states such as hypertension or aortic stenosis, and lastly, RV pressure volume overload states where the LV cavity is actually crushed by its neighbor. In the other group, we have conditions where the LVOT geometry specifically becomes altered. And this can be the case with sigmoid septum, asymmetric septal hypertrophy, and lastly, redundant anterior mitral valve leaflets or anterior displacement of the mitral valve from either mitral valve surgery or also from hokum.
Going back to our equation, the second component of setting up LVOT obstruction is the hyperdynamic state, or underfilling, or some combination of the two. Now, LV underfilling includes all the usual suspects of hypovolemia, dehydration, hemorrhage, overdiuresis, or the use of vasodilators. But it can also include relative reductions in filling from tachydysrhythmias or iatrogenically from increased chronotropy. And in general, with an increased emphasis on fluid restrictive strategies, as well as deresuscitation efforts, we ourselves may be inadvertently laying the groundwork for dynamic LVOT obstruction. Lastly, there's the contribution of hyperdynamic states which can either be global, as is the case with sepsis, or the use of inotropes, or regional, as in the case of Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy, or from basal hypercontractility of the heart as compensatory mechanism post-MI. Now, it's easy enough to intuit that reduced LVOT diameter and reduced chamber size can generate fixed obstruction. However, these do not typically result in the spiral of worsening hypotension and shock that we see with dynamic obstruction which leads us to a discussion of the mechanism of the dynamic aspects of LVOT obstruction. But before we get into that, let's first start off with what normal blood flow through the LVOT looks like. Now, as we all know, during diastole, blood crosses the mitral valve into the LV chamber and is ejected through the LVOT into the aorta. Importantly, that blood pushes down on the mitral valve, keeping the LVOT clear. When the LVOT becomes narrowed, however, two things happen. One, this leads to flow acceleration at the obstruction, and the physics of this is modeled by the continuity equation, which shows us that when fluid moves through a pipe, the product of its area and velocity remains constant. Therefore, if area decreases in one section, velocity increases. You know this intuitively from if you've ever put your thumb on the end of a garden hose. The second thing that happens is that there's a change in pressure, which has to do with the conservation of energy. If you remember the Bernoulli equation, which I've heavily simplified in this example to drive this home, the static pressure exerted on the sides of the system fluid is flowing through is also inversely related to velocity, and the sum of these terms remains constant throughout the system. So, as blood flows through an area of narrowing, velocity increases, and therefore pressure must decrease, and the sudden decrease in pressure lays the groundwork for a vacuum to be formed. And this is referred to as the Venturi effect. To put this into context, during systole, as blood moves through the LVOT and encounters a region of narrowing, velocity increases, leading to a sudden decrease in pressure. And owing to the flexible nature of its tissue and its proximity to the LVOT, this results in the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve being drawn into the LVOT, resulting in the dynamic aspect of obstruction referred to as systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, or SAM. Take note that SAM results in a loss of coaptation of the mitral valve and allows for mitral regurgitation at the same time as the obstruction. Now that we've spent some time meditating on the mechanism of LVOT obstruction and we know how to identify it and go about measuring it, let's move on to what we actually do about it when we encounter it. A major guiding principle is that severe left ventricular outflow tract obstruction on the basis of an elevated peak gradient deserves treatment in order to mitigate the potential for escalating shock and hemodynamic collapse, even if it's not present at the time that it's initially discovered. The most important step in treating LVOT obstruction is dealing with the underlying cause. And so if that's hyperdynamic state from sepsis or from hemorrhage or reduced end diastolic dimensions due to something like RV overload, dealing with that first and foremost is a crucial step. Other tenets of therapy include increasing afterload by using fewer vasoconstrictors such as phenylephrine or vasopressin, avoiding additional inotropes as this will worsen the underlying condition, and in cases of significant tachycardia, controlling this using beta blockade. Now, as with any POCUS application, there are several important pitfalls for us to consider, specifically with respect to the spectral Doppler assessment of LVOT obstruction. The first is that, as the name implies, obstruction can be dynamic, as it can come and go. In this example, we show two waveforms on the left-hand side of the screen, which have a more typical triangular appearance, followed by several obstructive waveforms, which could easily be missed during a brief assessment. Another important pitfall has to do with the limitation of continuous wave Doppler, in that it lacks range specificity. Pulse wave Doppler is able to measure at a specific point, but this means that it's limited in terms of the maximum velocity it can measure. Continuous wave, on the other hand, is able to measure virtually unlimited velocities, but it's not able to pinpoint 
where along the line of measurement it's arising from. So if multiple flow patterns are captured along this line, they will overlay. In this example, the Doppler is aligned to the mid cavity and is actually through the mitral valve. As a consequence, it's capturing the waveform of both the mitral regurgitation jet, which if it was more complete, could actually completely obscure the obstructive waveform seen here. Another term for this that I find quite descriptive is something called spectral contamination. Now you remember I mentioned earlier the importance of screening for underlying aortic stenosis, and it's also because of spectral contamination. Owing to the high velocity, dense parabolic waveform that emerges because of aortic stenosis, when this is layered on top of mid-cavity or LVOT obstruction, it could easily obstruct these lower amplitude waveforms. As is demonstrated by this Doppler signal from a case report in 2015 from Parker et al., which shows significant aortic stenosis with LVOT obstruction buried inside of the waveform here. Lastly, and most practically, as with any spectral Doppler application, it's only as good as its ability to be aligned parallel to the flow. And in the case of this patient with Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy and a significant sigmoid septum, we can see that if we attempted to run the continuous wave Doppler aligned with the LVOT, we would actually be almost perpendicular to the flow that's demonstrated through the LVOT by the color Doppler here. To drive this point home, we did attempt to do this, and all we ended up doing was perfectly capturing the mitral regurgitation that was immediately adjacent and not capturing the LVOT obstruction at all. Now that we've gone through the underlying mechanism as well as our approach to assessment, understanding the pitfalls and management of LVOT obstruction, let's bring it all home with one last case. You're looking after a 55-year-old man who's been brought to the ICU with significant respiratory distress due to bilateral pneumonia. Owing to his severe respiratory failure, you proceed with intubation. However, post-intubation, he develops severe hypotension. He requires epinephrine pushes on top of the norepinephrine infusion he is already running, which is rapidly escalated with vasopressin and epinephrine infusion added on top. Once again, you proceed with a focused ultrasound to look for other etiologies of shock. The study is technically difficult, but even so, we are still able to say that there's no significant LV failure or RV failure and no evidence of pericardial effusion, and it is abundantly clear that he is significantly hyperdynamic and is severely tachycardic. As we move to assess the LVOT VTI for stroke volume determination, you do note that when you apply the color over the LVOT, there's significant aliasing, and the specter of LVOT obstruction does raise in your mind. This is further bolstered by the presence of aliasing in the left ventricular outflow tract. Seeing this, you walk the pulse wave gate from the mid cavity to the aortic valve and identify that the LVOT is indeed the most significant source of aliasing and switch to continuous wave Doppler, which shows a characteristic dagger-shaped waveform with a peak gradient of 54, indicating a hemodynamically significant LVOT obstruction. He is given IV fluid, and you push phenylephrine and start an infusion and rapidly titrate off the epinephrine, and eventually the norepinephrine is titrated down as well, and you start beta blockade on top of this to control the tachycardia. On reassessment of his LVOT VTI, we see that there is complete resolution of the dagger-shaped waveform and return of the normal waveform morphology. So before we conclude, let's review our key takeaways. The first is that significant hypotension in the setting of any hyperdynamic state should raise our suspicions of potential LVOT obstruction, and that this is especially true in patients who have altered LVOT geometry, and that a large number of patients in the critical care setting are at risk for it. Next is that when we use pulse wave Doppler to measure LVOT VTI as part of stroke volume determination, and we find that there's significant aliasing, that the next step is to switch to continuous wave Doppler to evaluate for an obstructive gradient. And remember that characteristic dagger-shaped waveform that establishes the presence of obstruction and can be seen in the mid-cavity through to the LVOT. In terms of grading severity, remember we use the peak gradient and that greater than 30 is significant and greater than 50 is severe. Lastly, remember the pitfalls of spectral contamination from overlying mitral regurgitation or aortic stenosis that can obscure an obstructive waveform. And similarly, that as with all spectral Doppler, non-parallel angles of acquisition will also hide obstruction. Thank you for watching, and be sure to check out other videos on Western Sono for more great point-of-care ultrasound content.
And if you need an ultra quick refresh on how to perform LVOT obstruction assessment or a variety of other POCUS applications, check out the POCUS and Practice YouTube channel for this and other rapid fire how-tos.